we're here today, as you know, to mourn the loss and, but also uh, of Paul Smollinger, but also to celebrate uh, a life well lived and a life that was um, full of, of uh, richness and he included us all in that circle. Uh, so it's to mourn his loss, to celebrate his life, but I would like to add a third reason for our, our event today, and, um, and that is to celebrate the, the life of this woman here, of Judy. Uh, so, um, because uh, I was thinking this morning that, you know, when I grow up, I kind of want to be like Judy. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, don't you? I mean, don't you want to be the kind of person that she is and has been? Um, the kind of person that so consistently and openly cares for someone and for others. So I think that's the third reason. And, um, and we're here for one, uh, for one reason, is to give this person a whole lot of hugs today. So I want to see hands of people who are going to do that. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce Nancy Strange in just a moment. And then following that, Dan Gammon will sing. But I just wanted to add a couple of comments of my own about Paul, because this was the only opportunity that I'll have to do that. And uh, I've known Paul for over 30 years, and he and Judy moved in in the next, just right in the, just across the street from us at the bottom of our driveway. And there were a couple, three things that impressed me so much about Paul is that um, our son was two years old when, when they were there. And, um, and, and, and talking with Paul just a few months ago, he, he, would, he would repeat back things that our son said 30 years ago. Uh, he repeated back things that I, a story I had told him 30 years ago. So that when he was uh, around you, it became, I became aware, he was very engaged with you. So you knew not to say or do anything around Paul. <laughs> like, oh, well, he won't remember that, you know? It's like, you know, like that bottle of wine is, is empty right now. He's not going to remember nothing. Well, don't count on that. Um, the second thing, of course, is that Paul uh, loved food, um, was very generous with food, but he, he, he loved life, and he wanted you to love life. If you were around Paul, you you were going to be eating good food and hearing good music. Uh, you were going to be in a, a circle of fellowship and good times. Um, and it wasn't just that he enjoyed life. You were going to enjoy life, you know, if you were with him. And I will tell a brief story, and this is the only uh, chance I'll get to speak. Um, a friend of mine and I went to New Orleans several years ago, and Paul, I had called Paul to ask him, uh, about a place to stay and if there was any help he could be you know and he said yeah yeah I can I think I can get this place above this store you know and it's like and I thought well okay you know um, it's is it a warehouse well yeah it's sort of like a warehouse I said well, we need to have sleeping bags on the floor I mean is there a bathroom uh, well no no there's a bathroom and you won't need sleeping bags so I thought we were going to be staying in this warehouse you know so we get to New Orleans, and Paul and Judy take us to the warehouse, right, upstairs. In the, well, it turns out it's this beautifully furnished apartment. He had tricked me the whole time with artwork all over the place and, and wine in the refrigerator. And, and then he and Judy took us on tours around New Orleans and, then, uh, and, and got us free tickets to see the Neville brothers at Tipitina's. And so he was just the consummate host, just always, uh, not only that time, but every, that was the most welcoming, I suppose, I'd ever seen him, but, but uh, when you were around Paul, you always felt you are welcome, and, and I am engaged with you, and we are going to enjoy this time together, and I think um, that's an appropriate way of introducing uh, our time today. So first, Nancy Strange will sing, and immediately following her, Dan Gammon will.
And Marcus is accompanying me. Now, uh, this is Dan Gammon and Steve, and uh, they're going to sing, Dan's going to sing, I Shall Be Released. They say that every man must fall But I swear I see my reflection 
direction Somewhere so high above this wall I see my light come shining From the west down to the east Any day now Any day now I shall be Yonder stands a man in this lonely crowd A man who swears he's not to blame All day long I hear him crying so loud Crying out that he was framed I see my light come shine Any day now, I shall be released. Oh, is that me? Yeah. Don't go away. Oh, Nancy Brennan. <laughs> We're going to sing Angel Man. And if, if, you know it, any, if you know anything we're singing and you want to sing along, you're sure welcome. Oh 
Come and around me stand, oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Bear me away on your snowy wings to my And Shirley Harkins is going to read. She'll tell you all about it. <laughs> um, it's a blessing to be here today. Um, I first met Paul when he was seven years old. Um, I was nine years old. He was um, my brother's best friend, uh, beginning in the second grade. So I have memories of him playing and with my brother on our farm. And uh, then fast forward to uh, the UT days. Uh, Paul and I actually had the same major, what a coincidence. And then met Judy. Judy and I had some classes together. And it was like, wow, you all are together? How cool was that? And um, I had the blessing to visit them in New Orleans a couple of times and um, in listening to Bill reminisce about those visits, that was exactly it. It was just um, a wonderful time, a wondrous time, some of the best times of my life. So Judy asked me to do a reading. It, this was one of Paul's favorite pieces. It's, it was actually um, the lyrics of a song by Yes that he liked. Um, close to the edge and the fourth movement of it. It's entitled uh, Seasons of Man. The time between the notes relates the color to the scenes, a constant vogue of triumphs dislocate man, so it seems, and space between the focus, shape, ascend, knowledge of love, as song and chance develop time, Lost social temperance rules above. Ah, ah. Then according to the man who showed his outstretched arm to space, he turned around and pointed, revealing all the human race. I shook my head and smiled a whisper, knowing all about the place. On the hill, we viewed the silence of the valley, called to witness cycles only of the past. And we reach all this with movements in between the said remark. Close to the edge, down by the river, down at the end, round by the corner, seasons will pass you by. Now that it's all over and done, called to the seed, right to the sun. Now that you find, now that you're whole, seasons will pass you by. I get up, I get down, I get up, I get down, I get up, I get down. We had a little change in our program, and uh, Alex McCullough is going to sing um, where'd it go? If Thou Be Near, which was a special song that was sung at Sherry's wedding. And Paul actually rewrote some of the lyrics for that, I think. So this is Alex McCullough.
Steve uh, Roberts, I think he went to high school? Oh, college? He knew Paul when they were young. <laughs> and uh, he's going to do a, well, he'll tell you. He's, but they went to a Neil Young concert, which is inspired the song he's singing. So he came here from Crossville today. So uh, I live in Crossville, but uh, I'm originally from the West Knoxville area. And uh, for a few things that stand out to me about Paul are his great personality that has already been touched upon. And also, I think uh, the music, which uh, I want to play a song really in celebration of his life. Uh, and he, too bad we can't play all the kinds of music he liked because he liked so many. But another one is his sense of humor, his laugh. He had just such a wonderful laugh. And that's, uh, so I just want to tell you a brief story about how I got to, uh, how I got to know him. I was uh, probably 17, a senior in high school, and I got to know a mutual friend. Uh, his name is uh, Tony Schultz. Uh, he was kind of a little wiry guy who his mother had died in grade school. It's kind of a sad story. And then he kind of, you know, had some issues, but uh, he was very, had a great personality, and I, he invited me to his house one evening. He lived in, in West Knoxville in uh, Marywood Estates, which is close to Suburban Hills, for those of you who are from here, probably know where that is. And So I went to his house that evening, and I pulled up in my old car. It's a 67 Camaro. I actually still have that old car, dark blue. <laughs> I drove down the hill to his house, and when I pulled in his driveway, this lady across the street came running out with a rake in her hand, yelling and screaming at me saying I egged her house, and I've never egged anybody's house, you know, uh, so uh, I just kind of looked at her, and she was just, just raging, screaming, well, Tony, like I say, he was this wiry little guy, and he came out, and he was just real feisty, and he was just, you know, he was saying, what are you talking about, and they were getting in a fight, and then he started chasing her around the yard with this rake, and my <laughs> friend Tony was, uh, he would, he would run around and hide behind a tree, and he'd stick his head out and go, bloop, bloop, bloop. <laughs> and so about this time here comes a car in the driveway and uh, it's his big brother Biggin is what he called him Tony had a nickname for everybody so he called his brother was Jim he called him Biggin and if he if he really liked you then he called you old and then whatever your name is so he always called me old Steve and he always called Paul old Paul and he always called Bob old Bob yeah so but uh, anyway his brother was Biggin so Biggin came up to her and said, what the heck's going on here? And well, who was with Biggin was Paul, and that's the first time I'd ever met him. And so here's Paul, and he comes up, and he's just cracking up laughing. And he has this high-pitched laugh. Ah, I can't, don't even want to admit it uh, to try to imitate it. But it was the, uh, I think I was just kind of drawn to him, you know, just because of that personality. And I think we hit it off great. And uh, we ended up going through the years, uh, doing a lot of things together. We hung out and had a good time, like a lot of us did in those days. And uh, he ended up moving to New Orleans, and I think uh, he maybe moved back. And I had a music store at one time, and I remember he helped me move a piano from South Carolina to, to, uh, to Knoxville. And uh, we did a, I went to New Orleans, I think, three times. And every time we went down there, he'd just always take us to the greatest places. And the greatest uh, music, and I remember on New Year's Eve in 1998 or 99, I can't remember, probably wasn't 99, that would have been 2000, it was what? It was 99, anyway. <laughs> well, maybe it was, it was New Year's, so it was one of those years. <laughs> and uh, he took us to a bar, what was that bar, Judy, that we went to, or that? The what? The Old Point Bar, for those of you from New Orleans. And, Rosie Lede was, so this was our introduction to Zydeco, so I fell in love with that and bought an accordion after that and later have learned this uh, Irish folk accordion. So, you know, Paul uh, and music, you know, it's, it all kind of fits together. So I'm going to do a, uh, a song tonight, uh, or today, it's a Neil Young song, because I know we like Neil Young because that was the first concert we went together is in 1978. He, he and uh, myself and Tony Schultz and uh, someone else went to Atlanta to see uh, Neil Young during uh, when he uh, played, uh, I think it was when the Tum Comes a Time CD came out, for those of you who know Neil Young, and uh, record, well, it probably was an eight-track tape in those days, right? <laughs> I don't think they had CDs. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, I can remember listening to that CD down there, going down there, so I know he, 
I know he liked uh, the song I'm going to play. It's called Four Strong Winds, which is actually written by Ian Tyson. I think it's probably one of the few songs that Neil Young did that he didn't write himself. So. And I'm going to have some help here, so these people might actually make me sound a little better than I actually have. I'll go out to Alberta Weather's good there in the fall Got some friends I can go looking for Still I wish you'd change your mind If I'd ask you one more time But we've been through this a hundred times or more strong winds that blow lonely seven seas that run high all those things that don't change come what may if the good times are all gone then I'm bound for moving on I'll look for you If I get there before the snow flies And if things are looking good If you need me, if I send you down the fair But by then it would be winter Not too much for you to do And those winds sure can Strong winds that blow lonely, seven seas that run by, all those things that don't change, come what may. If the good times are all gone, then I'm bound for moving on. I'll look for you if I'm ever. Sherman. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to pronounce your last name. Frazier. Frazier. Okay. Hi. Um, when I met Paul, my name was Sharon Ann Thurman. <laughs> um, and it hasn't ever mattered what my name was to him or who I was married to <laughs> or where I lived. He was 
my constant friend, always there and always faithful. So this sonnet says to me the kind of love that Paul had. And I was just thinking the other night, Judy, it's, I want to dedicate it to you as well because it really says exactly who you are. It's Sonnet 116. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Luann Morehouse is going to read a poem by Tennessee Williams. My one regret is I never made it to the Stelloff at the Tennessee Williams Festival. And my daughter's name is Stella, so we really needed to have gone to that. Not that you could joke, though. We, yeah. Oh, yeah. I won't do it now, though. It's, it's neat that you should speak about the Stella contest because although... Paul was ever a Tennessee boy and was always very proud of his home state and, as you know, lived here numerous times and in many great circumstances. But there was a different Tennessee that introduced me to Paul and Judy, and that was the festival that's held every year in New Orleans. It's called the Tennessee Williams New Orleans Literary Festival. And I had the... Uh, privilege and the task of helping to make that festival happen every year in March. And Paul and Judy were an essential part of that festival for many years. They were, I used to think of them as uh, ninja volunteers, because they would appear and suddenly there would be a lot of disorder for a moment, and then there would be a table and a tablecloth, and there would be people lining up to sign up for the Stanley Stella Shouting Contest. And it was a raucous ending to that five-day festival. And we always could count on Paul and Judy to be great company at the parties in particular, the receptions and so forth, and at the events that took place that day. So thanks to Tennessee Williams, I got to know Paul and Judy, and it has been a great time. We had the tremendous fun of being in a Mardi Gras club together, the Funny 40 Fellows, and uh, you could always count on, in a room full of people, if you could find Paul and Judy, you'd be at the very center of the most fun imaginable. <laughs> so in honor of Tennessee Williams and of Paul, Judy found a lovely poem, which is also printed in your program. And I think it says a great deal. It's a wonderful cautionary tale for those of us. We have not long to love. Light does not stay. The tender things are those we fold away. Coarse fabrics are the ones for common wear. In silence, I have watched you comb your hair, intimate the silence, dim and warm. I could, but did not, reach to touch your arm. I could, but do not, break that which is still. Almost the faintest whisper would be shrill. So moments pass as though they wished to stay. We have not long to love. A night, 
a day. So I looked out and I got to spend a week with Paul and Judy in New Orleans too. And I, I went down and played at the school Judy taught at and hung out with them all week. And uh, it was awesome. And um, we were taking a walk on the, well, we were by the, on the, the levee. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I started to say the bayou is a levee. And uh, this boat came by, and it was like a tourist kind of boat, and on the calliope it was playing, do you know what it means to miss New Orleans? So, and Judy was mentioned about, remember when we were out there and the calliope came by, and I, immediately that song just popped in my head, and that, that uh, I remembered us standing there listening to it. So that's what I'm going to sing now. <laughs> Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans, to miss it both night and day? No, I'm not wrong, the feeling's getting stronger the longer I stay away. I miss the moss-covered vines, the tall sugar pines, where mockingbirds used to sing. And I'd like to see the lazy Mississippi a hurry. Soon I'm wishing that I was there. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans when that's where you've left your heart? And there's something more I miss than what I care for more than I miss New Orleans. Lamont Ingalls is going to deliver the eulogy. You know, like so many people who are here tonight and have spoken about Paul and Judy and their meetups, we also met them in New Orleans. Uh, they were catering a, a fundraiser at a gallery down near the quarter. My wife and I were there. And we immediately found out we had Mona Clavo in common, who's here tonight, 
and also the fact we were expatriate Tennesseans, you know, enjoying this uh, crazy, wonderful uh, Delta city, New Orleans. And it's like there was a bond there immediately. You know, it's very sweet-tempered, sweet people, funny, very welcoming, Paul and Judy. And it wasn't too long before we were at their parties, at the parades with them, traveling with them. So just, uh, it's been almost 30 years now. And it was all uh, 30 wonderful years of knowing uh, Paul and Judy. And of course, I'm grateful for everyone who's, who's here today. I know you've come from, uh, whether it's from down the pike or across the mountain or all the way down from the Delta to honor Paul. I'm really, really glad to see everyone here. So it's a very special person. And we talk about gratitude. Uh, Roman statesman uh, Cicero, he's a statesman and orator, said that gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. Uh, truly, we are grateful for having known Paul in our lives as friend, as member of family or tribe, as colleague or associate. We were all fortunate to be blessed with his sweet-souled presence during his 30 years in the Knoxville area and his equal number of years living in New Orleans. As we gather here in remembrance, we share a collective gratitude for our portion of those years Paul was here with us. Gratitude for being a sister, our cousin, our nephew, our niece to this special loving soul. Gratitude for those years of friendship that he kept and nurtured and valued from grade school and high school in Knoxville through his college years at the University of Tennessee and the University of New Orleans. Supported by Paul's long attendance to relationships, some of these friendships lasted for a half a century, even longer. It's a remarkable run of mutual caring and communication. We are particularly grateful for the 40 years Judy Carter Smallinger was with her beloved giving and supportive partner and husband in Knoxville and at their home on Algiers Point in New Orleans. Paul was an open-hearted and generous man who shared his many talents with family, friends, and visitors alike. Paul was creative and giving in countless ways. He greatly enjoyed using his gift for imaginative and flavorful cooking for dinners and gatherings in Knoxville and New Orleans, a talent that he practiced as home chef and caterer during just about all the holidays and festivals in New Orleans, and that's more than a full-time job or as the head planner and designer and master of ceremonies during gatherings for a friend's birthday or anniversary, or sometimes just simply because, because it was a fine Sunday afternoon that needed celebrating with his many friends. Paul was also a gifted artist, a person born with style. At one time, he and Judy were partners in a gallery and design shop on Magazine Street in the Garden District. And when you walked into Paul and Judy's home, you entered a brightly lit three-dimensional painting, a space designed with painterly creativity and architectural panache. From ceilings to walls to floors, a space of open-heartedness and welcome, filled with their and their friends' arts and crafts, wall hangings and treatments, murals and drawings. And surrounding this welcoming home was a garden mosaic of colorful shrubs, ancient oaks and flowering trees, culinary herbs, and all shapes and hues of flowers and grasses. It was a small paradise in an old New Orleans neighborhood, a creative and renewing space admired by passers-by and neighbors and indicating the inspired and creative and inventive presence of Paul Forrest and Judy Carter Smallinger. Paul seemed to be constantly in creative motion, setting up a breakfast nook or a banquet table for friends and family or with Judy's advice and consent, decorating a room or a porch on the side gallery of their century-old house on Olivier, Olivier Street for an evening of sitting with friends and sharing food and drink, and enjoying their company. Whether it was getting ready for a New Year's or Halloween celebration or a weekend soiree during carnival season or an open house for the neighborhood dogs, Paul set the scene with his acute visual sensibility and style and furnished the vittles as he sometimes said, honoring his East Tennessee roots. He was, in short, a consummate host and someone who created many memories of conversation and feasting and general enjoyment and merriment at their home in, Al in the Algiers Point neighborhood, six blocks from the Mississippi levee. 
Those of us here are doubly blessed if we were there at 503 Olivier Street to experience those sweet olive and jasmine scented evenings of food, frolic, and conversation. Those nights of festivity and tale telling and wandering the world in our conversations were truly memorable. And like our dearest Paul, precious and irreplaceable. Among his fond of talents, Paul had a great gift for singing and for playing the piano. He sang in church choirs and quartets and as a soloist or one half of duet at weddings. When he visited, he always had a selection of well-tuned and well-chosen songs playing. He loved music of all kinds. From Zydeco and a levee side bar or a brass band at a second line parade on Rampart Street or Dixieland and gospel and blues and rock and roll at the New Orleans Jazz Fest or the Americana and bluegrass bands he and Judy enjoyed at the WDBX Blue Plate Special concerts here in downtown Knoxville. There always seemed to be music around him. I think he and Judy lived their lives within music, moving about the city, bringing their own soundtrack, livening up the place wherever they visited. Another of Paul's supreme gifts was storytelling. He, oh yes, everybody knows that. <laughs> He could tell tales of the foibles, quirks, pratfalls, and eccentricities of friends, co-workers, local and national politicians, or relatives, just the general run of the human comedy, a long-running play for which he always seemed to have a front row seat. And he didn't leave out his own idiosyncrasies and peculiarities when he told his tales. If you wanted to know the saga of a family trip to visit Ken in East Tennessee, or who broke the furniture at an uptown Mardi Gras party and exactly how they broke it. <laughs> or the ongoing chronicle of a changing assortment of couples collectively known as the Bickersons. Paul would regale you with well-told scenes and conversations and make you holler loud and laugh long. But he wasn't mean-spirited in the telling. He was always both sharp-witted and good-humored. And he often featured himself wearing and sharing the fool's cap. In another era, I think he would have been a boon companion to Mark Twain, or maybe even his opening act. He was a very special person, fondly remembered for his intelligent wit and humor. A special note in Paul's character was his longstanding love for dogs in general, and for chows in particular. He and Judy have had a decades-long succession of well-tended, indulged, and precocious chows. Their most recent pack of four-footed companions are Chin Chin, Teddy Den and the new baby, Lockie. Paul cherished and took close care of his dogs. And I think the two older dogs returned Paul's years of service to the dog nations by looking after him since he had his stroke in September of 2012. Chin Chin and later Teddy Den watched over him constantly and would walk behind him, urging him along as he struggled to regain a portion of his mobility. Dogs, Paul would say, help us heal. Paul's brain was severely injured by his stroke, but his sense of connection to others always remained, as did his determination to recover as much as possible of what the stroke had taken away. And during every day of Paul's five-year struggle to recover from the effects of his stroke, Judy was his constant, never-failing, and attentive caregiver. She often spoke about his desire to regain his mobility and the physical struggles he went through to regain his movement and how he was gladdened whenever he reached a therapeutic goal. Those who worked with him as therapists, nurses, and physicians in New Orleans and at the Patricia Neal Center here in Knoxville recall him as a special man who was unfailingly communicative and a pleasure to work with, even as he pushed through pain and long cycles of gain and loss. Gradually, he was able to increase his mobility and to return to a measure of the activities that he greatly enjoyed. These included following and discussing politics, cooking gourmet meals, sampling new restaurants, and sharing stories and laughter with friends and family. Paul maintained his optimism and sweet soul connections with others throughout his difficult therapies and his search for relief from a pain that was nearly constant. I think he maintained that lightness of being about him even throughout the physical challenges of his later life. Paul was a gentle and kind and light-filled soul. 
some would say an old soul, who was sorely missed by all who traveled with him, whether for a season or for several decades. His spiritual essence lives on in us through our many, many memories of his sweet and sharing, creative and cheerful, cheerful person. In closing, I would like to quote a few lines from English poet William Wordsworth. These lines remind us of the never-ending, ever-renewing eternity that we live within. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, has had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar. I'd like to think that a Paul's soul is rising to gladden other hearts in some other place and time. We're gathered for a sad, sad day, but Paul is here in memory and spirit. I know he would have embraced this gathering of friends and family, sharing music, food, and Paul's stories. And I think it could be said of him as it was said of American writer Jack Kerouac, he honored life. Thank you. One more song we're going to do, and uh, this one we're going to get down, because <laughs> I think Paul would want us to get down. <laughs> so this one's glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down. <laughs> it's been a long time. I've forgotten how to play rock and roll. But... <laughs> Oh, 
glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down, glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down, going home to see my mother. Since I laid my burden down. My mother and my father, since I laid my burden down, glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burden down, glory, glory.
Steve Roberts, Nancy Brennan Strange, Dan Gammon, Paul Smollinger. Paul Smollinger.